Two days ago, you all helped Mowgli free several animals from the same circus that had enslaved him for over four years. In doing so, a fire broke out that claimed the life of al Adin. What happened after? Did we wait until the fire burned down and look through the ashes? Do you waited around for the fire to be put down. People fought all night to keep it from catching around the neighborhood. You managed to gather some of his things. He gave his life to save a baby creature. Breakfast is quiet. Where do they go when they're gone? I still believe that my parents are somewhere. Your grandmother is somewhere. I, I can't believe otherwise. He didn't reply. And... Mowgli taps to his heart and then taps to the ground and then taps to the ground and then taps to his heart. Father Grimm speaks of the horrible event, the great fire at the circus. He then makes his way over to where the three of you sit apart from the other children. Your children are very quiet over here and you still smell like smoke. It reminds me of a dream that I had that the crying God sent to me last night. A wonderful and terrible dream. I dreamt that the dead three had returned. The dead three? Merkel came first. He walked and the dead rose to meet him. Merkel is the Lord of Bones, and Zin Bane, the Lord of Strife, and finally, Baal, the Lord of Murder. <laughs> the three dark gods themselves. They came out of the ground to the east and followed a long golden rope straight here to Baldur's Gate. A terrifying sight to behold. For this I cried four tears. And I knew at that moment that there would be hope. For when I looked down to see where the tears had landed, I saw the four of you standing defiantly against the terrors rising out of the east. I do not know why Ilmata has chosen you to stand against the shadow of the dead three, but he has, and there it is. But you say four of us. Does that mean that something has saved Aladdin? Is he still here or is he gone? Ah, uh, ah, uh, Liebchen, uh, yeah, yeah. I forgot this part as a dream. Uh, that fourth tear, it burnt my face. When I awoke, I could still smell the smoke. I had thought that perhaps I had left a brazier burning perhaps in the church behind this orphanage. Brazier. Brazier in Brazier. the church. Mowgli can smell the smoke and the fire. So I, I hurry over uh, to go check it. Alone? Um, Will you come with me? Rapunzel come? Yes. The normally cold structure that is the humble shrine of Ilmata, the crying god, is warm and bright, and a flame flickers from within. Brazier, a stone bowl for incense and burning coals, burns near the altar in front of the crying god's kneeling broken statue. As you approach, you look down into the flames of the brazier. You see a young, familiar, more than familiar, al Adin curled in the fetal position. He is, appears to be asleep, and he is in the center of the flames. Comfortable, quiet, asleep. Small prince? Prince? Stirs just a bit, and then begins to awaken. Small prince! You look red and different. And he is taller than he used to be. He is now your height. Small prince, how did you get here? I was in the fire. I couldn't get the lock open, and I wished with all of my might to free the little mammoth, but my ring, it, 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 it contained the spirit of a minor chin in, in your world. You call him Ifriti. I had not heard his voice in this world since I arrived, but 
As the fire consumed me, the, the djinn judged me and he, he said I was worthy and that we would burn together from now on. You step out of the brazier and you rejoin your friends. You are here and that's what matters. He, you do not look like the small prince I know. He is different, but he's here by magic. I do not feel like before, but I feel I am better. Stronger? Yes, and closer to getting home. I never believed that you were gone. I saved these for you. Red, thank you very much for believing. I'm so glad that you are here. I'm glad to be back. Prince? The prince is here. Friend? Yes. Friend? Friend. Friend? Yes. And we look out for each other. Friend? 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 Friend! And I bite my hand. What are you doing? Blood starts to trickle down a little bit. Are you okay, Mogli? Uh, friend, it, um, we are a, a, a pack. We are a family. Yes, 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 we are a pack. I think he wants to take a blood oath. Like in the story. So I take out my, uh, my hand axe and I cut myself uh, on my hand. Yes? Yes. Yes. You trust him. Friend. I do. It's our friend. He's back. Rapunzel. I already, I already owe you my life. Rapunzel, you have saved us many times. Please join us. Together. 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 Now let's go tell Father Grimm. He needs to know that his dream came true. Yes. Rapunzel, it is you that hears the music first in the distance. It's coming from behind you somewhere. Do you hear that? The rest of you hear music now that your attention is drawn to it. You hear the music. It's happy music. It's party music. There's music. I do not like celebrations. Why? He died? Not all celebrations are bad. They're not? No. Are you sure? Yes. I know it has been difficult and bloody, but that is not all there is to life. Now can we hear it, how far away is the music and where directionally is it coming from? There is music coming from within the orphanage. That is without a doubt. Well, we're headed back to the orphanage anyway. So let's keep heading that direction. Small prince, meet tiny prince. Hello. Another. It is a toad. A frog. The frog. It's just a frog. He does not talk. What is his name? Frog. Uh, does he have a name? You would know, perhaps? I think you get to name him. And I think you should kiss him. That's what I said. No. <laughs> kiss like in book. Like in, like in, yes, in the book. Frog. Kiss the book. You kiss the frog. Kiss the frog. Kiss the frog. You kiss the frog. You no. kiss the frog. Ew. No. Kiss the frog. No. You kiss the frog. No. <laughs> Please don't be offended. What's gross? Someday she'll kiss the frog. No! <laughs> that wasn't one of the 80 books oh. in the tower. So how close are we to the door at this point? Oh, this you guys can go around the corner and enter it, I will. So we, we open the door and we enter. Very good. When you open the door, you enter an all-out celebration. Children are laughing and clapping and dancing with clowns and jugglers and musicians. It's a strong man with children hanging off of every arm. Uh, they're swinging back and forth. In the middle of this place, there is a magician. The circus has come to the orphanage. I growl. 
Among the chaotic merrymaking and children playing you see in the center of the room, the magician has the majority of eyes on him. He carefully yet dramatically holds a child, a baby child, a very small one, aloft for all to see. And the kid is smiling and the kids are doing this. Uh, he carefully yet dramatically snaps his hand out and he produces a cloak out of thin air and he puts the child underneath the cloak. And he definitely covers the baby girl in it. He then flourishes his hand over the covered child and tosses the baby up and steps away. And the cloak goes <gasps> And then it stops. It does not fall to the ground. Then the cloaked bundle slowly rises into the air and begins to hover back and forth. And everybody goes, oh, ooh, and the kids lose their mind. They all lean forward. The magician reaches out for the floating cloak and then snaps it back to reveal a man in a top hat, stooped over and a dramatic bow with the baby in his arm. The magician says, Lords and ladies, boys and girls, our ringmaster, Phineas Theogenes Carnum. The band plays a ta-da chord. Ta -da! And all the children cheer and begin to chant, do it again, do it again. Phineas Theogenes Carnum slowly rises. He holds the baby girl in his arms. She's laughing and coos. His eyes fall on all of you guys, especially you. He glances at the child in his arms and quickly hands it off to a clown who deftly takes it out of his hands. And Phineas is like, mm. and he glides across the room towards you. Oh, how I love children. They are the future, you know. That hair. You could be a star. And then he changed the direction. Are in the sky, I could not be a star. Ah, Rapunzel. He changes direction and glides through the room. Jugglers start bouncing around and doing stuff and start dancing. There's a mime who is doing this and the kids are trying to get around him and he tries to get back to them, but he can't because there's this invisible wall between them and they all laugh and giggle and stuff. The ringmaster moves with widespread arms to Father Grimm, hugs him and he's like, and you, Father, oh, Father Grimm, what you have done for these children, these wonderful, tiny souls, what can I say? You've done so much good for this world, so much good. Initiative. No. What? Five. 22. Uh, uh, 16. 13. Your perceptions are high. Most of you can see this. This is Carnum talking, talking and hugging Father Grimm. And Father Grimm is like, he's very happy to hear this and hear his children laughing and having fun and being entertained. It is wonderful music to his ears. Then you see a tear from Father Grimm's eye. <laughs> A tear, especially with those with very high perception, you see that his expression on his face changes. He goes, <coughs> and blood spittle <coughs> drips down his mouth. And it is here that you notice Carnum's arm <gasps> is doing this. And Carnum says, so much good, too much good, really? And you see Father Grimm? No. <coughs> the ringmaster steps back. A dagger wet with blood in his fingers. Father Grimm just hangs there in the air for a moment, the smile fading from his lips. He staggers and begins to slump. Carnum hands the dagger off to whomever. I'll have my star now. And he grabs his hat and he snaps it, and he holds that position for a moment. You guys see what happens to Father Grimm. As a result, you are in a surprise condition. From behind you, 
you hear too late. The door open, and you hear a katak, katak, katak. Boom! Everybody roll 20 sided. This is a save. Constitution, please. Nine. 16. 11. 13. 13. There is light and compression. All you hear is Your ears ring. The grenade goes off and causes a paralyzed condition. From behind you, you feel your body getting bumped to the side and you see something very big. You recognize it immediately. You are also well acquainted with it. Lieutenant Commander Gefalian walks in. It reaches out and grabs at Rapunzel. His massive hand, which is about this size, wraps around Rapunzel's head, picks Rapunzel up like a doll. And as he walks by, you see the woman, and she has a torch in her hand. <laughs> and she blows flames up into the ceiling. And as Lieutenant Commander Gefalian starts to turn around, Carnum looks up at the ceiling. Oh no, your home is on fire. Pity and his expression changes. He snaps his fingers. Lieutenant Commander, we're done here. You always have to leave them wanting more. And he turns and he leaves, and Gefalion follows him. Everybody rushes out with Gefalion leaving last, and Everybody in his Everybody but not the children. Not the children. Uh, the children are left in here as Gefalion leaves. He hits the door jam with his shoulder and it cracks, and part of the door jam drops in front of the door, and more of the place kind of crumbles on top of itself. Not an easy way to exit anymore, and with fire to boot. Everybody has filed out directly in front of Gefalion, and Gefalion and the fire breather are the last two. You guys are on the ground for a moment, blinking hard. Your ears are still ringing. You notice blood coming from them just a little bit, but you do distinctly feel heat on the back of your neck. It's coming from the ceiling. It's starting to rush. The kids are all over the floor and they're blinking hard and they're kind of rolled to their sides and, and then they realize, oh, this is not good. And they start to cry. Many of them start to cry. Some of them start to scream. This place is definitely ablaze. We need to get the kids out of here. So I'm gonna rush to get the kids together as quickly as possible. We're kind of ushering them out and we're headed to that, toward that door, toward that entrance. That is where the majority of the fire is. When the fire breather did it, they did it close to the front entrance and it's all fallen kind of in. So you could crawl in and around it, but it's also the hottest part of the building is down there as well. No, then let's get them to the windows. So okay. We, we rush to the windows, we usher them toward the windows. Is there anything, any objects that we can put there so that they can climb up onto the object? And That's a good idea. Them? Yes, you could definitely get the cots that they sleep on and the tables that they eat on and put them at an angle if you wanted to. Okay, so grab the cots. And, uh, and, and you know, I'm telling everyone to grab the cots and we're, we're trying to put them in that position so that they can crawl out. You have no problem doing that. You start to put the cots in the right position. These windows haven't been opened in quite some time as you realized when you tried to open it to meet Boots, the crow, for the first time. Um, go ahead and try to can open I it. Can I take my axes and try you to just break can. the glass open? Very nice. And, and cut around so that there's no like glass. You can bash it. Yeah. You have no problem. Um, give me an attack. 18. Give me damage. That was a one. Um, so that's two. You break one small piece and you hammer at it and you hammer at it and eventually you break through it. It takes a little bit of extra time, longer than you would have liked because the smoke is starting to fill up, but you do break through. Okay. You have one window open. Do you want to only get them all through one or do you want to open another one while they start there? I, I want to get the, how many kids are there? About 20. Can I'm going to hop up yeah. and I'm going to also um, attack one of the windows. Very good. Give me an attack. All right. Oh, okay. Uh, that's gonna be 21. Very good. Attack, uh, give me damage. All right. That's going to be four plus three plus two equals nine. Very nice. 
you shatter most of the glass. There's still a little bit of structure and you have to spend a little bit of extra time kicking out of the way, but that's not a problem. Once it's broken and you break the structure, you start having a passage that the children can also crawl out. I imagine you guys have put both of the tables against the wall so that there's a path yeah. to get out. That was an excellent idea. You cut your uh, time to do this down quite a bit and you start to exit the children. Who's on the other one? Who's helping with the other side? I am. Okay. I notice Red and think they have a good idea and I rush to help them. And you start to usher them out quickly and relatively orderly. Take some time, but you guys get it out. And immediately, uh, you notice that the children are ready to run everywhere on the outside. Do you want to keep them uh, protected on the outside as well? Because they're freaking out. They want to run in every direction. How many do we have out at this point? You're getting a good number of them out. They're going pretty quickly. And do you, do you want to be the last out? Yes, that's why I, I wanted to get the kids out first. I have a resistance to fire. Why don't I, I um, I'm gonna climb out the window first and then I'm going to essentially corral the children you as if they this. were just tiny wolf pups and keep them, even if one is running off to be scared, just kind of jump in front of it, comfort it, keep it in place. Very well done. In my new form, I have a resistance to fire so I can reach the children that are closest to the flames and herd them out and not. You guys work well together and you get this done. Um, you corral the children. It takes some time, but they are all out. They are all safe. You managed to save all of the children you believe. Give me a perception roll and oh, no. if you're still inside, give me a perception roll. No. Okay. Uh Three, four, so, uh, seven. Oh, okay. You think they're all out? Uh, Francis, also give me a perception roll because you're on the inside. Twelve. You believe that they are all outside. You guys. <laughs> That's reassuring. What do you want to do about it? You're not sure. Um, I think with, at this point, the fire is raging, right? We should get out. I call out to the children very loudly. Children, children. And I search all over that I can without damaging myself for Give me any an signs. investigation. You see what he's doing though. He's looking in all the small spots because he doesn't feel but good about But he's flame this. resistant, I'm not, right. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you like to do? Um, you wanna get out early or do you wanna help him search? Honestly, I feel like at this point, we think we've gotten all the kids out. As far as I can perceive, I think I've gotten them out. I have a piece of equipment, my ring. I think I can summon the djinn and ask him if he can search the area to find any remaining children and confirm that we have gotten everyone out. Do that. Your old reflexes take you to the ring that you secretly wear on your toe. <laughs> and you forgot that burnt away when the Ifrit judged you worthy. You are the ring. You are the jinn. If anybody's going to do this, it is going to be you. <sighs> okay, we burn together. And I go for a second pass to locate any children. It's getting hot now. You want to get out? I, I do want to get out, but I'm also, I'm not leaving him again. I said I wouldn't. So I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to say, I'm not going to leave you. Go. Go. You're safe? I'm safe. Then I'm gonna get out. Very well. Give me a second investigation. 19. You were a small child, and you knew how to hide when the city guard K 
came and you were in trouble. Or you know how to hide when your mom came home and you were in trouble. And you sometimes hid in the kitchen cabinet. Yes, I did. And it's the one place you haven't looked. You do so now. You have a gut feeling about it. And there was a kid there, sh shaking and crying, eyes closed, doesn't even look up at you. She knows that this place is safe. I, I rushed to her and, and using my cloak and wrap it around her and rush through the flames, exiting as fast as possible, protecting her with my flame resistant. Perhaps Yasmin will see you again because today you are a hero. He emerges from the orphanage that is well on fire. I point to the child and say 20 and turn to red, counting children, 20. Excellent. Beautiful. Perfect. All of the cubs are accounted for. That the humble wooden structure that was the orphanage lies burnt in ruin. But through your valiant efforts, you managed to save every single child and relocate them to the old but somewhat drafty stone church of Ilmata. Children will be safe there for now. And the nearby neighbors of Baldur's Gate are pitching in to take care of the children and make them comfortable in the face of this catastrophe. The small church's front door creaks open. There's a dark silhouette in the doorway. It is tall and gaunt. It stands grim against what life has left behind him. It tosses something to the stone floor of the church. That something rolls and then comes to a stop. It is a head, a woman's head, the fire breather's head. The gaunt figure steps forward into the candlelight. His face is well blackened, covered in soot from the fires of the orphanage with long tear streaks from eye to jaw that make for a dour mask upon his aged pale skin. But you recognize his steel gray eyes. Brother Grimm. Weak, gaunt, but stern, with a well-used longsword in his hands. He looks at you. That man killed my brother. I'm going to need a fast horse if we are going to save this girl. Woo! Nice. 